On September 25th, 2007, Rob Pike, Robert Griesemer, and Ken Thompson have been discussing a new programming language for a few days, and Rob suggested a name, Go. The next year, Ian, Lance, Taylor, and I joined the team, and together, the five of us built out two compilers and a standard library, leading up to the open source release on November 10th, 2009. For the next two years, with the help of the new Go open source community, we experimented with changes, large and small, refining Go and leading to the plan for Go 1, proposed on October 5th, 2011. With more help from the Go community, we revised and implemented that plan, eventually releasing Go on March 28th, 2012. The release of Go 1 marked the culmination of nearly five years of creative, frenetic effort that took us from a name and a list of ideas to a stable production language. It also marked an explicit shift. In the years leading to Go 1, we changed Go and broke everyone's Go programs nearly every week. We understood that this was keeping Go from use in production settings, where programs could not be updated weekly to keep up with language changes. As the blog post announcing Go One said, the driving motivation was to provide a stable foundation to make users confident their programs would continue to run for years to come. So after Go One was released, we knew that we needed to spend time using Go in the production environments it was designed for. We shifted explicitly away from making language changes toward using Go in our own projects and improving the implementation. We ported Go to many new systems. We rewrote nearly every performance critical piece to make Go faster. And we added key tools like the race detector. Now we have five years of experience using Go to build large production quality systems. We've developed a sense of what works and what doesn't. Now it's time to begin the next step in Go's evolution and growth to plan the future of Go. I'm here today to ask all of you in the Go community, whether you're here in the audience at GopherCon or watching on video, or reading the Go blog later today to work with us as we plan and implement Go 2. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain our goals for Go 2, our constraints and limitations, the overall process, the importance about writing about our experiences using Go, especially as they relate to problems we want to solve, the possible kinds of solutions, how we will deliver Go to, and how all of you can help. The goals we have for Go today are the same as in 2007. We want to make programmers more effective at managing two kinds of scale. Production scale, especially concurrent systems interacting with many other servers, exemplified today by cloud software. And development scale, especially large code bases worked on by many engineers coordinating only loosely exemplified today by modern open source development. These kinds of scales show up at companies of all sizes. Even a five-person startup may use large cloud-based API services provided by other companies and use more open source software than software they write themselves. Production scale and development scale are just as relevant at that startup as they are at Google. Our goal for Go2 is to fix the most significant ways Go fails to scale. The goals for Go have not changed since the beginning, but the constraints on Go certainly have. The most important constraint is existing Go usage. We estimate that there are at least half a million Go developers worldwide, which means there are millions of Go source files and at least a billion lines of Go code. These programmers in that source code represent Go's success, but they are also the main constraint on Go2. Go2 must bring along all those developers. We must ask them to unlearn old habits and learn new ones only when the reward is great. For example, before Go1, the method that was implemented by error types was named string. In Go1, we renamed it error to distinguish error types from other types that can format themselves. The other day, I was implementing an error type, and I, without thinking, named the method string instead of error, which, of course, didn't compile. And so after five years, I still have not learned or unlearned the old way. That kind of clarifying renaming was important to do in Go 1, but it would be too disruptive for Go 2 without a very good reason. Go 2 must also bring along all the existing Go 1 source code. We must not fragment the Go ecosystem. Mixed programs in which packages written in Go 1 import packages written in Go 2 and vice versa must work effortlessly and perfectly during a transition period of multiple years. We'll have to figure out exactly how to do that 
automated tooling like GoFix will certainly play a part. To minimize disruption, each change will require careful thought, planning, and tooling, which in turn limits the number of changes we can make. Maybe we can do two or three, certainly not more than five. And I'm not counting here minor housekeeping changes, like allowing identifiers in more spoken languages or adding binary integer literals. Minor changes like these are also important, but they are easier to get right. I'm focusing today on possible major changes, such as additional support for error handling, or introducing immutable or read-only values, or adding some form of generics, or other important topics not yet suggested. We can only do a few of those major changes. We will have to choose carefully. So that raises an important question. What is the process for developing Go? In the early days of Go, when there were just five of us, we worked in a pair of adjacent offices separated by a glass wall. It was easy to pull everyone into one office to discuss some problem and then go back to our desks to implement a solution. When some wrinkle arose during the implementation, it was easy to gather everyone again. Rob and Robert's office had a small couch and a whiteboard, so typically one of us went in and started writing an example on the whiteboard, and usually by the time the example was up, everyone else had reached a good stopping point in their work and was ready to sit down and discuss it. That informality obviously doesn't scale to the global Go community of today. Part of the work since the Go open source release has been porting our informal process into the more formal world of mailing lists and issue trackers. But I don't think we've ever explicitly described our process. It's possible we never consciously thought about it. But looking back, I think this is the basic outline of our work on Go, the process we've been using since the first prototype was running. Step one is to use Go to accumulate experience with it. Step two is to identify a problem with Go that might need solving, to articulate it, to explain it to others, and to write it down. Step three is to propose a solution to that problem, discuss it with others, and revise the solution based on that discussion. Step four is to implement the solution, evaluate it, and refine it based on that evaluation. And finally, step five is to ship the solution, adding it to the language or the library or the set of tools that people use every day. The same person does not have to do all of these steps for a particular change. In fact, usually many developers collaborate on any given step, and many solutions may be proposed for a single problem. Also, at any point, we may decide we don't want to go further with a particular idea and circle back to an earlier step. And although I don't believe we've ever talked about this process as a whole, we have explained parts of it. In 2012, when we released Go 1 and said it was now time to use Go and stop changing it, we were explaining step one. In 2015, when we introduced the Go change proposal process, we were explaining steps three, four, and five. But we've never explained step two in detail, so I'd like to do that today. There are two parts to explaining a problem. The first part, the easier part, is stating exactly what the problem is. We developers are decently good at this. After all, every test we write is a statement of a problem to be solved in language so precise that even a computer can understand it. The second part, the harder part, is describing the significance of a problem well enough that everyone can understand why we should spend time solving it and maintaining a solution. In contrast to stating a problem precisely, we don't need to describe a problem's significance very often, and we're not nearly as good at it. Computers never ask us, why is this test case important? Are you sure this is the problem you need to solve? Is solving this problem the most important thing you can be doing? Maybe they will someday, but not today. So let's look at an old example from 2011. Here's what I wrote about renaming os.error to error.value when we were planning Go 1. It begins with a precise one-line statement of the problem. In very low-level libraries, everything imports os for os.error. Then there are five lines, which I've underlined here, describing the significance of the problem. The packages that OS uses cannot themselves present errors in their APIs, and other packages depend on OS for reasons having nothing to do with operating system services. So do these five lines convince you that there's a problem here that's significant? It depends on how well you can fill in the context I've left out. Being understood requires anticipating what others need to know. For my audience at the time, the 10 other people at Google who were working on Go and reading that document, those 50 words were enough. To present the same problem to an audience at Gotham Go last fall, an audience with much more varied backgrounds and areas of expertise, 
I needed to provide more context, and I used about 200 words along with real code examples and a diagram. It is a fact of today's worldwide Go community that describing the significance of any problem requires adding context, especially illustrated by concrete examples that you would leave out when talking to coworkers. Convincing others that a problem is significant is hard but essential. When a problem appears insignificant, almost every solution will seem too expensive. But for a significant problem, there are usually many solutions of reasonable cost. When we disagree about whether to adopt a particular solution, we're often actually disagreeing about the significance of the problem being solved. This is so important that I want to look at two recent examples that show this clearly, at least in hindsight. My first example is about time. Suppose you want to time how long an event takes. You write down the start time, run the event, write down the end time, and subtract the start time from the end time. If the event took 10 milliseconds, the subtraction gives a result of 10 milliseconds. This obvious procedure can fail. When our clocks are not quite in sync with the daily rotation of the Earth, a leap second, officially 11.59 PM in 60 seconds, is inserted just before midnight. Unlike leap years, leap seconds follow no predictable pattern, which makes them hard to fit into programs. Instead of trying to represent the occasional 61 second minute, operating systems typically implement a leap second by turning the clock back one second, so that 11.59 PM in 59 seconds happens twice. The clock reset makes time appear to move backwards, so that our 10 millisecond event might be timed as taking negative 990 milliseconds. Because of this problem, operating systems now provide a second clock, the monotonic clock, that has no absolute meaning, but it counts seconds and is never reset. But except during this odd clock reset, the monotonic clock is no better than the time of day clock, and the time of day clock is useful for other things, like telling time. So for simplicity, Go1's time APIs expose only the time of day clock. In October 2015, a bug report noted that Go programs could not time events correctly across clock reset, especially a typical leap second. The suggested fix was also the issue title, add a new API to access a monotonic clock source. I argued that this problem was not significant enough to justify new API. Uh, just a few months earlier, for the mid-2015 leap second, Akamai, Amazon, and Google had all slowed their clocks a tiny amount for the entire day, absorbing the extra second without turning their clocks backward. It seemed like the eventual widespread adoption of this leap smear approach would eliminate leap second clock resets as a problem on production systems. In contrast, adding new API would add new problems. We would have to explain the two kinds of clocks, educate users about when to use each, and convert many, many, many lines of existing code all for an issue that might plausibly go away on its own. So we did what we always do when there's a problem without a clear solution, we waited. Waiting gives us more time to add experience and understanding of the problem, and also more time to find a good solution. <coughs> In this case, waiting added to our understanding of the significance of the problem in the form of a thankfully minor outage at Cloudflare. Their Go code timed DNS requests during the end of 2016 leap second as taking about negative 990 milliseconds, which caused simultaneous panics across their servers, breaking about 0.2% of their DNS queries at peak. Cloudflare is exactly the kind of cloud system Go was intended for, and they had a production outage based on Go not being able to time events correctly. Then, and this is the key point, Cloudflare reported their experience in a blog post by John Graham Cumming titled, How and Why the Leap Second Afflicted Cloudflare DNS. By sharing concrete details of their experience with Go, John and Cloudflare helped us understand that this problem was too significant to leave unfixed. Two months after that article was published, we had designed and implemented a solution that will ship in Go 1.9. And in fact, we did it with no new API. My second example is support for alias declarations in Go. Over the past few years, Google has established a team focused on large-scale code changes, meaning API migration and bug fixes applied across our code base of millions of source files and billions of lines of code written in C++, Go, Java, Python, and other languages. One thing I've learned from that team's work is the importance when changing an API from using one name to another of being able to update client code in multiple steps, not all at once. To do this, it must be possible to write a declaration forwarding uses of the old name to the new name. C++ has sharp define, typedef, and using declarations to enable this forwarding, but Go has nothing. 
Of course, one of Go's goals is to scale well to large code bases. And as the amount of Go code at Google grew, it became clear both that we needed some kind of forwarding mechanism and also that other projects and companies would run into this problem as their Go code bases grew. So in March 2016, I started talking with Robert and Rob about how Go might handle gradual code base updates. And we arrived at alias declarations, which are exactly the needed forwarding mechanism. At this point, I felt very good about the way Go is evolving. We talked about aliases since the very early days of Go. In fact, the very first spec draft has an example using aliases. But each time we had discussed them and later type aliases, we had no clear use case, and so we left them out. Now we were proposing to add aliases not because they were an elegant concept that we liked, but because they solved a significant practical problem with Go meeting its goal of scalable software development. I hoped that this would serve as a model for future changes to Go. Later in the spring, Robert and Rob wrote a proposal, and Robert presented it in a GopherCon lightning talk here last year. The next few months did not go smoothly, and they were definitely not a model for future changes to Go. One of the many lessons we learned was the importance of describing the significance of a problem. A minute ago, I explained the problem to all of you, giving some background about how it can arise and why, but no concrete examples that might help you evaluate whether the problem might affect you at some point. Last summer's proposal and the lightning talk gave an abstract example involving packages L, C, L1, and C1 through CN, but no concrete examples that developers could relate to. And as a result, most of the feedback from the community was based on the idea that aliases only solved the problem for Google and not everyone else. Just as we at Google did not at first understand the significance of handling leap second time resets correctly, we did not effectively convey to the broader Go community the significance of handling gradual code migration and repair during large scale code changes. So in the fall, we started over. I gave a talk and wrote an article presenting the problem using multiple concrete examples drawn from open source code bases, showing how this problem arises everywhere, not just inside Google. And now that more people understood the problem and could see its significance, we had a productive discussion about what kind of solution would be best. The outcome is that type aliases will be included in Go 1.9 and will help Go scale to ever larger code bases. The lesson here is that it is difficult but essential to describe the significance of a problem in a way that someone working in a different environment can understand. To discuss major changes to Go as a community, we will need to pay particular attention to describing the significance of any problem we want to solve. The clearest way to do that is by showing how the problem affects real programs and real production systems, like in Cloudflare's blog post and in my refactoring article. Experience reports like these turn an abstract problem into a concrete one and help us understand its significance. They also serve as test cases. Any proposed solution can be evaluated by examining its effect on the actual real-world problems the reports describe. For example, I've been examining generics recently, but I don't have in my mind a clear picture of the detailed concrete problems that Go users want generics to solve. As a result, I can't answer a design question like whether to support generic methods that are parameterized separately from the receiver. If we had a large set of real-world use cases, we could begin to answer a question like this by examining the significant ones. As another example, I've seen proposals to extend the error interface in various ways, but I haven't seen any experience reports showing how the large Go programs attempt to understand and handle errors and how the current error interface hinders those attempts. Those reports would help us all better understand the details and significance of the problem, which we must do before solving it. I could go on. Every major potential change to Go should be motivated by one or more experience reports, documenting how people use Go today and why that's not working well enough. For the obvious major changes we might consider for Go, I'm not aware of many such reports illustrated with real-world examples. These reports are the raw material for the Go2 proposal process, and we need all of you to write them to help us understand your experiences with Go. There are half a million of you working in a broad range of environments and not that many of us. Post them on your own blog, on Medium, as a GitHub gist, or as a Google Doc, and then add a link to our new wiki page, which is named Experience Reports. Now that we know how we're going to identify and explain problems that need to be solved, 
I want to note briefly that not all problems are best solved with language changes, and that's fine. One problem we might want to solve is that computers can often compute additional arithmetic results during basic operations, but Go does not provide direct access to those results. In 2013, Robert proposed that we might extend the idea of two result expressions to basic arithmetic. For example, if x and y are u and 32 values, then low comma high equals x times y would return not only the usual low 32 bits, but also the high 32 bits of the product. This problem didn't seem particularly significant, so we recorded the potential solution in an issue, but didn't implement it. We waited. More recently, we designed for Go 1.9 a math bits package that contains various bit manipulation functions. The package has good Go implementations of each function, but the compilers also substitute special hardware instructions when available. Based on this experience with math bits, both Robert and I now believe that making the additional arithmetic results available by changing the language is unwise, and that instead we should define appropriate functions in a package like math bits. Here, the best solution is a library change, not a language change. A different problem we might have wanted to solve after Go 1.0 was the fact that Go routines and shared memory make it too easy to introduce races into Go programs, causing crashes and other misbehavior in production. The language-based solution would have been to find some way to disallow data races, to make it impossible to write or at least to compile a program with a data race. How to fit that into a language like Go is still an open question in the broader programming language world. Instead, we added a tool to the main distribution and made it trivial to use. The race detector has become an indispensable part of the Go experience. Here, the best solution was a runtime and tooling change and not a language change. There will be language changes as well, of course, but not all problems are best solved in the language. So finally, how will we ship Go 2? I think the best plan would be to ship the backwards compatible parts of Go2 incrementally, feature by feature, as part of the Go1 release process. This has a few important properties. First, it keeps the Go1 releases on the usual schedule to continue the timely bug fixes and improvements that users now depend on. Second, it avoids splitting development effort between Go1 and Go2. Third, it avoids divergence between Go1 and Go2 to ease everyone's eventual migration. Fourth, it allows us to focus on and deliver one change at a time, which should help us maintain quality. And fifth, it will encourage us to design features to be backwards compatible so they can ship earlier. We will need time to discuss and plan before any changes start landing in Go 1 releases, but it seems plausible to me that we might start seeing minor changes about a year from now for Go 1.12 or so. That also gives us time to land package management support first, which we have to get done. Once all the backwards compatible work is done, say, in Go 1.20, then we can make the backwards incompatible changes in Go 2.0. If there turn out to be no backwards incompatible changes, maybe we just declare that Go 1.20 is Go 2.0. Either way, at that point, we will transition from working on the Go 1 release sequence to working on the Go 2 release sequence, perhaps with an extended support window for the final Go 1 release. This is all a bit speculative, but I want to make clear that we're not abandoning Go 1, and that in fact we will bring Go 1 along to the greatest extent possible. We want your help with all of this. The conversation for Go 2 starts today, and it's one that will happen in the open, in public forums like the mailing list and the issue tracker, and on blogs. Please help us at every step along the way. And what we need most today is experience reports. Please tell us how Go is working for you, and more importantly, not working for you. Write a blog post, include real examples, concrete detail, and real experience, and link it on our wiki page. And that's how we'll start talking about what we, the Go community, might want to change about Go. Thank you all very much.